everyone. My name is Sadana Sananayaka, and I will be talking to a number of exceptional women who have made impacts in their own industries and sectors as a part of a series brought to you by the Frederick Nauman Foundation's Female Forward Initiative. Today we have with us Kasturi Chalaraja Wilson. Kasturi is the Group Chief Executive Officer of Hemas Holdings, PLC. She joined Hemas in 2002, where she held many senior management positions. She was recognized as one of the 12 top women change makers in the country in 2019 by the Parliament of Sri Lanka. Hi, Kasturi, how are you doing? Hi, Sadhana. It's great to be with you today. Great to have you on the show. Thank you for taking the time to be with us. Yeah, my pleasure. So how are you doing holding up in lockdown now? Ah, yeah, I, I'm sure it's, it's a challenging as everybody, what everybody else is going through. But I guess we realize now that is a, it's more than us, right? If As long as we are safe, we make sure that we're doing the right things and being safe and not exposing others to it. It's just that um, the, the community needs that. Um, the spread of infection has to reduce and each of us have a part to play in it. So I guess you keep that and hope for the hope that the country comes out of it. When you see the infection rates and the death rates, you think, you know. I couldn't this. agree. I couldn't agree. Yeah. Um, so we're going to jump into the questions now. Um, so to start off, Kasturi, you're seen as a leading example of a successful woman in the corporate world. How did you begin such a successful career? <laughs> like, take us back to the beginning. <laughs> yeah, like, I, I, I kind of cringe each time somebody says the word success. I think yeah, where I come from, uh, success and the definition of success depends on what each one defines in the way. And for me, it's... Um, I feeling fulfilled, I think, is um, my, my version of success in some ways. Um, so how did it begin? Um, I think it began if me not wanting a career so that I was not okay. overly pressured to, um, to focus on it as a career and where are you going to end up? I, I, um, and I, I, I guess I knew what made me happy at any given time. And it has changed over time, right? I, I wouldn't say it's been the same thing, but at least me knowing what makes me happy as a human being. Um, so knowing that and not knowing that the career was not was was not my predominant focus or or the area which made me happy was an easier thing, which made me relax and perform at my best in anything I did. So I was driven by a whatever I undertook, I wanted to do it well. And it was not with the focus of going ahead in my career, but with the focus of uh, excelling in, in it. And, and, and the fact that I wanted to be seen as somebody who was good at it, because that's my competitive nature, right? And um, when that happens, I guess people don't focus on where the end outcome is, but just making sure you do extremely well and get feedback and get you know appreciated for it and be known as you're one of the better person people in that. So just doing those basic things um, made me good at my whatever job I did and whether it was sports or job or whatever, I, I um, excelled in it. Or I, I tried to be the best I could be in that job. The second thing is I was open to taking up um, non-traditional roles and taking up challenges whenever somebody threw it at me, right? Uh, in that context, um, I was an accountant and my, my uh, entry levels were into finance, but I knew that I was good at it, but I also knew I didn't like it. I, I never loved that job. I loved doing well at it, but I didn't love it as a, as a, a job. So that, that alone and, and the fact that I was open to taking up um, different roles and being um, unafraid because that whole flip at when you open yourself to going into a new role, which is an uh, area you're not used to, there's always that risk that you might fail in it, right? But the fact that I was not interested in failing, I just wanted to learn and do well in that role was something which kind of made me just keep pushing forward day by day or just making, taking it one day at a time. And eventually you kind of come to a different role. So today I'm, I'm, I'm holding a role and that's my job as group CEO. Yes, there is a path to it. And that path came through because I just knew what I liked every day and knew what I was good at every day. And I knew what I didn't, was not good at all as well. So 
that has been my story and uh, you, you can call it as success or just call it as your journey you would say that you know you have to have like a spirit of like you know have be fearless and you have to be bold as well in every in every like decision that you make in your career yeah i guess so you're you're spot on there sadhana because uh, i my fearlessness came i think from as a child my parents um, didn't have a boy and and i was the the tomboy of the family right so i was encouraged to and being the second in the family i was encouraged to try things which my elder sister was not allowed to try things no from climbing trees or learn, learning to drive ride, ride a bike or learning to ride a motorbike when i was still in school when my mother didn't even know so those those different things in life skills which you try and when you're fearless about it and you learn um by falling like i mean motorbike i would have fallen so many times and had so many bruises but i i got up got back on it right and i came back and that lesson of not being afraid to fall and not being afraid to get bruised knowing that you can always stand up get up and try it again and do better the next time kind of gives you this whole um, uh that way of approaching uh, whether it's a career or whether it's your life um boldness comes from i guess i go i don't know whether it's just the background in sports or my personality again boldness comes from not being afraid to fail i guess no and 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 being comfortable and um, not not actually being apologetic to for failing or being who you are so i i i i never backed down from a challenge i was i was one of those most one of the very competitive people even in school um i i didn't focus on coming first in class but the day i fell was borderline dropping from the third position i was like competitive i i didn't want to drop down below that so there is an aspect of that as well which which comes um, out so yeah fearlessness and boldness is key part of it yeah that's awesome that's awesome but i think that's what most women kind of lack sometimes is that like you know when they there's a sense of like unsureness and you know i'm a woman in a very male dominated field so that's kind of what my next question is right so like looking at all you have achieved which is incredible the path must have been very challenging especially because you're a woman in a very male dominated field so can you tell us a little bit about those challenges that you faced specifically because of your gender so i must say uh, i faced challenges but um predominantly um it was not because i i didn't see it as a gender based thing um because the environment looked predominantly my career the last 20 years has been at hemas before that i was at uh, aramex for 3 years which was um, the ceo was a arab gentleman who was very liberal male and he respected the skill versus gender and then i was at a audit firm for 10 years which was again there was i mean it was lots of women diversity was in the favor of women uh, so at that point i at hemas i didn't actually um feel this whole gender based uh, kind of uh, challenges initially the i did have challenges gender based but it was purely because i was a single mom so my challenges were how do i uh, have my career how do i make sure that i am happy as a mom as well and i'm i'm be i'm able to focus on my kids when i want to i know it's a balance or imbalance but how do i manage that and how does the company facilitate me to be the mom i want to be so those were the challenges and the fact that the culture enabled or permitted me to be the mom i wanted to be to make sure that whenever i wanted to be there for the kids or had to be there for the kids i was allowed to do that um so those challenges were not faced and the second challenge was if if what generally people face is where you don't when you have career progression right they say that um, you kind of uh, women are not given those leadership roles which are uh, seen as male dominant and and uh, my first role there was i guess when i moved from um, um from a head of shared services to a cpo role cpo it was technically the cio's role and at that point um, 
we had an Indian gentleman who was a CIO. And imagine I'm going into a technical role, which I didn't know anything about. And B, I was going into generally the tech, technocrats are guys, right? Um, but again, there was faith that I could, I could, my strength was understanding business versus technology and get the technologies to, to, to do the solutions and for me to push the business outcomes. And I realized the, the organization was gender blind when it came to roles. They actually looked at skills and most capable um, individual. And it, if it was a female, so be it. However, when you start growing, going up the ladder and I started taking leadership roles, like the first uh, managing director's role, business leadership role, was in logistics and maritime, right? And that is, um, they are, uh, it's a kind of a male dominant industry. And the leaders were men at that time, right? All the MDs of the big logistics companies were men. So um, you kind of are surrounded by these biases, biases as to what a leader should look like, a bias as to how the leader should conclude business deals, they come with this perception that's the traditional way and the only way of doing it. And, um, and what this, um, you know, how do you engage with the industry? So that was a tough thing. And I myself doubted how, you know, I questioned myself as to how I'm going to own that space. A, I was never a person who, oh, okay. So one big thing was they made deals on the golf course, right? I didn't play golf. And I was like, I don't really want to go and play golf. And, you know, I'm, I'm one of those fast game girls. I, I, I'm used to such, such fast games like netball and basketball. And this golf was something I was not really, it was not appealing. Second thing is I don't even do evening, you know, where people go out for cocktails and do deals because my time in the night so precious because of my kids. So how do I still drive business? And I, I had to make choices and I, I would still go out, but I would always tell them, look, I need to leave early because my kids are waiting for me. And, and uh, I had to use that opportunity for them to understand that, um, see my strategic mind and see what how we could grow business. And necessarily you'll be amazed. People understand that there is more value in that and they don't expect you to conform to the traditional ways of doing business I mean, socializing and engaging and developing relationships, they respected that. So that way, I must say that we also, as when we go into the role, we have this perception that people are not going to accept you and not adjust to the method of you or you where you're owning your space. But surprisingly, people do. There would be people who, you know, there are exceptions to this case. But so I, I, I kind of found that happening. And even in pharma, everybody kind of respected me. Uh, there was an exception, but you know, you push through that, you, you kind of take those exceptions on head on. And it works. So I didn't feel it, but I, I, I do see that as a, as a challenge for many. Uh, it depends on the organization culture also. And over years, if it has been um, a male dominant kind of a boardroom and a culture, it's very hard to change, not intentionally. It's unintentional. It's the same thing. If you have a, a female dominant culture, it would be very tough to get uh, a man to adjust. But this guy would be wondering, like, we, our conversations are different. Our interests are different. You talk cricket and politics versus uh, none of them really interest me. And what am I going to sit and chit chat? So it's both parties understanding. They all believe they need the change. They respect the individual's uh, capability. And they kind of consciously enable this change. So it's, it's work on both sides. That's a really good, uh, good point that you made because the corporate also themselves have to think about you know, how can we be more inclusive in a way that, you know, that doesn't like, you know, you know, break the wheels so much, but, you know, cause women do feel that they, you know, when you go to a corporate space, that there are certain challenges that they face that are different to me. It's like the simple thing of not being able to stay out late at night because, it's kind of more difficult for us to get a cab home safer than it is for a man. So for a woman who's facing those kinds of situations, how would you like advise them to, to overcome or to face those challenges? Do they speak to their bosses about it? Or what would your advice be? So 
I guess it's a bo- it's a bit of both figuring it out figuring out what works for you um so you can't do the late night but can't you make switch it to afternoon lunches so one thing i switched it when i was at an mbo of pharma because it was important that i met my clients who came from overseas uh, so i could, would kind of have afternoon lunch and meetings beyond that so that eventually they by five o'clock they're so tired they don't want to dinner <laughs> So I kind of exhaust them during the day and they don't want to dinner with me and they're tired of me. Um, but the second thing is, I guess uh, I always had a conversation. So I remember um, when I was um, being given the shared service head um, role, there was this whole thing about, um, Kasuri, can you work late? Because you, you, um, you, this takes a lot of, um, I mean, you're doing SAP integration and stuff like that. So I said, look, when it's necessarily I necessary, I work late. However, by habit, I'm not going to do it because I don't believe that I, I believe that I have to be efficient so that I finish my work efficiently. And I, I don't take joy in working till six, seven in the night every single day. There's something wrong in the way I work and I would have changed it. So I made it clear in conversation that that's going to be an exception and I'm willing to do that. But don't expect it to a norm and it's up to me to make sure I work efficiently that that's not a norm. So that was both ways. You don't expect it, but I also have to make sure that I'm efficient. The second thing conversation I remember was um, uh, when I had to kind of travel quite a bit and this conversation they had actually, is it that they understand if I can't do it all the time? Because A, once my kids grew up, my parents were old and they needed help and stuff like that. And they, they, were, they needed care. And, um, and these conversations were, um, uh, when you have a, you, you're, you're surprised when you have a conversation, both parties understand what's the, what is needed or what, what is needed for that other person to succeed. And, um, and it works. So um, the third one, I remember another incident was because I didn't do an MBA and, and I was always pushed to um, do some um, um, course. And eventually they said, uh, this Harvard one was being bantied about many times, but it meant that I had to stay 13 weeks to 12 weeks out of the country. And because my mom was um, dependent and she had uh, dementia, they knew that that was not possible. Even though my kids were overseas by then, it was not possible. Um, and they didn't force me at it. Till one point, I think um, Mutaza, who was one of the family members, was in charge of talent. He said, look, we found this thing. Harvard has now split this thing into uh, over a year. It's four times every three months for four four weeks or three weeks or something like that. And, um, you know, that week you can make that work. And if there's an emergency or your mom's issues, we could take care of them. That conversation that they that they knew very clearly that I was not comfortable leaving home for so long, and this was like four years ago, and I, I was already a managing director, but I still had responsibilities. But the the fact that when they knew my pain point, they find a solution. So, what I'm trying to say here is your challenges and your kind of commitments when when um, uh, you are a female career woman who who is a mom or who is a daughter. And culturally, till Sri Lanka develops a culture where men take equal part in the home as a homemaker, as well as um, taking um, equal share in in co-parenting, I think organizations have to have a chat. Otherwise, I'm not going to say I'm going to change the culture. It will be very tough, right? So you need to understand that, put that in its place and say it's necessarily not your problem, but you can make sure that um, women anyway succeed and we'll do our part in it. So, and and that's what we've been uh, doing. So that was my take. That's, I guess you have to have conversations. You, you can't do it without that's, that. that. That's really interesting because that links kind of to my second question, my next question. Um, so my next question is, basically what you've been kind of hinting about in your last few answers. So successful women are often asked the question, how do you balance career and family, but men are not. So how do you feel about that? Yeah, it's it's the same thing is, um, so I'll put it this way. I am yet to find anybody who is saying they are willing to give up motherhood to have a career. Um, I'm not, I was never willing to. The same time, people who want women who want a career 
uh, would say that how many of them would really be willing to give up a career for motherhood? I was willing to give up a career for motherhood. I didn't want a career, right? And when I had to provide for my kids, I chose, I knew the only way I could succeed was uh, to provide for my kids was to give, go back into work and then chose the entry point where I knew I could succeed and then you build from that. Um, so the balance and by nature, we kind of take, we worry, we worry whether we are the best mother we can be. We worry whether we have neglected work. We worry if my your parents are sick, uh, you take over the whole world's prob problems. And at that point, I always say the balance is a perfect imbalance. But the choice is yours. You know which point of your life that you spend more time with your family or your other duties versus more time at work. There are days you choose to be at work at an ungodly hour because that's the right thing and you knew it needed, that was needed at that point. And you kind of adjust that imbalance. There are times you skip. I've skipped board meetings, which are annual board meetings where you have all the independent directors. I've skipped it because I needed to be there when my um, um, when my kids actually entered uni and it was the first day. And my son didn't want me. I just wanted to be there. And, um, and that mattered to me. And it was okay to tell I chose that. And yeah, I was not sacked for it. I mean, nobody, when I came back, nobody said, look, you missed this and you've, you've neglected your job. It didn't happen that way. You have a conversation and tell what's uh, important. But the most important thing beyond that is conversation with people around. Even though you're taking the burden, I think your husband, your parents, your domestic, your, your colleagues at office all need to understand where you're coming from. And their support is needed. If not, that having trying to do it without your network is really tough. That's a really interesting point because I think that's basically what you're trying to say is that women need to speak up and articulate what they need in order to you know, make the corporate world more comfortable for them. But I think yeah. that's what Sri Lankan women, not, I'm not, I don't want to generalize, but we often lose our voice in places. So it's like almost difficult, so difficult for, for women who want to speak up. So what you would advise to do is to actually find their voice, right? Find their voice and necessarily it doesn't have to go in a manner that um, you're trying to fight a system. So it happens that you're, when you find you're trying, the, trying to tell the organization, bend rules. Right for me, so I was blessed that Hema's whether you were a man or a woman, families mattered for them. And that time, I think it was the tested when uh, I was going up the corporate ladder. I was a single woman who had young kids. They would bend plenty of rules because the kids mattered to me because they wanted me to perform well. Um, but you need to have this conversation and if you, you have to acknowledge that if there is a rule or unsaid pro process or policy, uh, sometimes it will have to be bent and they have to understand why it's happening. Uh, but I must say some stuff, some organization culturally, they're so embedded in this rule that uh, I, I, it, doesn't, it doesn't make sense. And it's still so dated that they don't understand the outcome. What was the objective of that um, policy in the first place? And you, you kind of have to evolve to that. So I guess how you have that conversation and tell them, look, your outcome is that you want me to work and this is the outcome for my job. I'll still give it. Just give me, give, give what you, tell them exactly what you can deliver. Tell them what are the things which bother you and tell what you're going to take it upon yourself to solve and tell what you want the company to adjust. So because I, somebody had done it for me, I know a child services, there was a girl whose mom had, cancer and, and she worked from home for two months this was like 15 years ago we talk about work from home now with COVID and and I I am so I'm so happy that COVID taught us one lesson and I think women at this point will have a better chance of um, actually succeeding and choosing career or and wanting a career while they enjoy motherhood because this gives you this work from home and flexibility gives you that option um, my the head of investor relations, she did gave birth uh, during COVID, and I think the first four months she worked even even <laughs> during law, the maternity leave because it was work from home. So I told her, look, after four months, I don't need to see you coming into office. Try to figure out a way you can manage it from home, 
make sure you choose tell me what are the days you want to come into work because i thought this is an option for them to see how best they can manage and you know the baby is 4 months till about a year it's that joyous time the mother bonds with the baby how can we allow them to do that and my pa is doing the same thing so i'm trying to figure out how i can manage with about a pa a working full time face to face but i have managed it so why not look at it at a, as a as an opportunity and and um, i guess culturally organizations if we want to uh, grow if we want to compete with global corporates you need the best talent you need talent who are happy and who are their minds are free to be creative and that way you have the best ideas generated for that you can't be having policies saying you can't do this you have to come at 8:30 if you come 5 minutes late i'm going to cut you over time it doesn't work so i think here it's more the corporates and the sme especially have to kind of open up see what successful companies are adapting see that it's it's a you you empower employees to manage their time at home but you have to trust them hold them accountable that absence of um, when you don't see them physically and you don't have visibility of what they're doing you don't trust them i guess we have to flip from seeing understanding that working 8 to 5 means they're working versus you can work 8 to 10 but still get the outcome you want that's fine so the other challenge is okay what how much more can i give this individual who is working smart at home so what happens from 10 to about 3 can i give more work that's a different story how do you how do you monitor work and do you monitor work at home those are challenge debates you'll have to have but i guess it's a it's a right time organizations also to to look at their culture because if we are going to be dinosaurs here we are not going to be able to compete in a global world you can't i think this i think with the with the pandemic people have had no choice but to adapt um, so i think it's now is the time when companies will see that whether they can you know whether they are going to go with the change or they're going to suffer with the change exactly. and uh, okay. and yeah and i think it's it's been um, quite eye opening for all corporates across the board in all companies at this time right Yeah. But you also see the ones that are like a little bit resistant like as soon as the lockdown is lifted they're like everybody come back to work. <laughs> I've seen that and I I'm like uh, and uh, they said no I've had enough at work I said yeah but the thing is why do we need to come to work? I I miss going into office. I mean but at the same time I'm just seeing how much of real estate can be used more efficiently. There are people who love um, working from home certain days. Right? So um, I guess uh, it's it's a time we all have to take and uh, see how best we can um um kind of adapt and the objective is look we have to have get the best out of everybody working for us and that means we have better outcomes so it's 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 a journey we have to figure it out um it's not an easy thing to adjust to because sri lankans we as we as human beings as soon as we things are normal we forget what we've gone through and we go get back into old habits so that's that's a thing which we have to kind of figure out okay so on top of your career you are also accomplished sports woman right so what is it about sports that you're so passionate about i guess um from sports i don't know i i was always um it may be the competitiveness i had and um, i love working in team so i i love the team sports so, and um, the fact that you can um, you play and you can and then and um, you either accomplish something or if you lose you learn from those mistakes but sports sports taught me a huge amount of life skills as in you need to commit and practice every single day sometimes do the same mundane thing every day just to improve by that one degree and uh, you don't become a rock star overnight um third one is that it your success depends on the person next to you so especially on a team sport right even in an individual sport if you don't have the support of your coach and your oh. your colleagues and your parents you're not going to succeed you can uh, it, it takes like it's the parents have to wake up get your food ready all that but on a team sport uh, the thing is if i 
for me i was a shooter or even in basketball if the others didn't defend properly they didn't get the ball to me i wouldn't be able to shoot if i didn't shoot the team wouldn't you know wouldn't get win the same time the person who's supposed to, the good defenders have to do their job so each of us have to push the other one to be the best they could be it's not about you and that is something i loved as a as a person i mean I, it was not about me and even even whatever we've achieved over time it was the team which did it it is just that i was part of a team and i had a role to play in it but each of them had a role to play and each of us had a title for some reason but that title didn't mean that you single handedly did everything so that was something and and the most important thing is i love the outdoors i love to sweat out and clear my mind so it's therapeutical and and and, and i guess i'm an outdoor person and and a competitive person so yeah that actually that actually taught you a lot about you know how to excel in the business world as well yeah i think that taught me a lot of my leadership style skills and how do you um integrate with people because uh you don't choose who your teammate is your they come from diverse background but you learn to appreciate everybody from different backgrounds because we only look at their skill and what they bring to the table so in a corporate we kind of um, we like to um, surround ourselves with people who are from the same background like minded think alike talk alike eat alike eat alike dress alike it doesn't work you need diversity and we should be able to respect somebody who doesn't speak like us somebody who speaks uh, comes from a different uh, part of sri lanka and from a different background but you know they have so much to give so i guess you kind of you will have diversity to thrive if you have been in a sports field you you really respect it and and it doesn't matter you kind of don't see uh, gender you don't see race you don't see color um, you don't see social background you only see skill and what together we can accomplish that's amazing that's that's really interesting to see because i think a lot of people forget like when they get so caught up in their careers they forget that you know to have like a healthy life and work balance so i think sports is a really good like you know factor that brings in that balance into people's lives right? and for our country i think sadhana i think every parent should and school should put more sports of life skills outside where they integrate with different people more uh, more out there is because i think that's the one way of bringing a united sri lanka our time i'm a tamil right at my time we didn't have that even though i mean 83 right so i was in the middle of it uh, i saw my friends who were singalese best friends who were singalese you know treating me like another person, human being there was no discrimination i and that was because of sports and uh, i guess we need this because if you politically this racism has been pulled at every point as a card just before an election and we as people feed on it and um, i if you can develop this thing about sri lankan sports let's win together yeah we are all from different different backgrounds because we never chose to be born this way we, we didn't whoever invaded us and left i'm sure if you look at history some of so all the blood has been integrated at some point um so it's one country as and if we can accept that and only thing which can bring us together in those forms is music art sports and and dance maybe and um, use use those as tools and that would be helping us to get the best in the corporate world as well i couldn't agree more so our final question for today is so you've achieved so much in your career already but what lies ahead for you like what else do you feel like you need to go out there and achieve and like, i'd get so one thing with borders me is um, okay well, okay what more is i love to travel the world a bit more remember i was um, i was busy bringing up kids and working and i didn't have too much of time uh, to to invest in myself but more importantly in sri lanka um i guess i see a lot of inequality and in some ways can we help to eliminate that in some ways um help yeah youth from different background to succeed and and how we can actually enable the masses to actually have better options and and have more confidence to uh, to want more for themselves yeah if i can do one of those 
I'll be quite content. Beyond that, I mean, basically, I just um, would like to give back more to the youth. But I, I feel if that's where the place we need to target for the for a better future. So that's. Yes, because the youth are definitely our future. So we definitely mm -hmm. start investing there. I know, and, and, and I'll tell you the youth, they have such an absolutely great mindset. I've been judging the Youth Awards uh, about a month back, and I noticed uh, they, they want a united country. They appreciate each other. Uh, and the minds in how they want to help each other to succeed together, different cultures and communities, it's amazing. And I, I noticed that so much, unity. All right. Thank you so much, Kasturi, for joining us today. That was a really interesting conversation. I know I learned a lot today. So thank you for giving your time to us. Thanks, Adana. It was a pleasure. And thanks, Ro, for having me on this show. It was our pleasure having you. And take care and stay safe. You too. Stay safe. Bye. Bye.